Good afternoon, everybody. I am Max Bergman. I'm the director for the Europe program here at CSIS, the Center for Strategic and International Studies. It is our pleasure to host you today for what is, I think, a really exciting event on U.S., European, and Japanese cooperation. And we're really privileged to do it with a, a real exciting think tank uh, from Brussels, the Center for Security, Diplomacy, and Strategy, CSDS, uh, which is at the Brussels School of Governance. I think with the war in Ukraine, it's quite clear the importance of U.S.-European cooperation. I think less clear is the critical role that U.S.-European-Asian cooperation has played in this, in particular with Japan. The EU, the European Union, has an economy the same size as the United States and China, roughly, and that when we all cooperate together, we have demonstrated, I think, over the course of the events in this war, the power of our cooperation. And an event like this today, I think, uh, really highlights the growing importance of working collaboratively from across the Atlantic and across the Pacific. Uh, today, we have an excellent panel of experts to discuss how EU, US, Japanese visions for the region converge or differ, because there are some differences and it's important that we uh, as a community, uh, as allies and partners work through those differences, as well as find ways that we can cooperate further. Uh, I have to say that we uh, are doing this event in somewhat of a hybrid capacity, but we're going to be really dependent on the online listeners, the people from all over the world that are watching this event, to come in and offer their questions. So please submit your questions through the Ask Live Questions button on the webpage. Uh, and it is my privilege now to turn it over to uh, our colleague and partner, Lise Simon, uh, who is the director of CSDS uh, and uh, who, at the Brussels School of governance, and he's also a visiting fellow, at least for the next week, uh, with the Europe-Russia Eurasia program here at CSIS. Uh, it's been a pleasure working with Luis, and, uh, and we, it's a great honor for us to be hosting this panel today. Luis. Thanks. Thanks, Max, and uh, good afternoon, everyone. So I'm Louis Simon, the director of the Center for Security, Diplomacy, and Strategy at the Brussels School of Governance, and also the director of the Brussels Office of the Royal Elcano Institute. So it's a pleasure for us, uh, CSDS, to partner with CSIS for this first Europe-US-Japan trilateral, more so uh, uh, this year, because as, uh, as, as Max was saying, I'm still affiliating with uh, CSIS, with the Europe program as a visiting fellow, so personally for me. Uh, so it's great to partner with the Europe program and also with the Japan chair uh, at, C at CSIS uh, on this. We've got our own Japan program uh, at CSDS that Eva Pixova uh, is leading. Uh, and in fact, we'll be launching a Japan chair uh, as of September this year. So we'll look forward to expanding our cooperation. Uh, I think, and Max already alluded to this, the timing for uh, to hold a Europe-US-Japan trilateral could hardly be better. Uh, we've seen the EU and the US uh, step up their cooperation in relation to the Indo-Pacific over the last year, uh, quite significantly, I would say, uh, with uh, uh, specific dialogues devoted to the Indo-Pacific, but also uh, to, uh, to China. And we've also seen Japan uh, recently play a, a rather proactive role uh, in uh, European security, uh, uh, not least during the current crisis in Ukraine. Uh, so I, I would say Japan is a key, is a go-to partner for both the United States, which of course is, is an ally, uh, but also for, for the European Union, uh, as well as NATO, in fact. Uh, and I think uh, its response to the crisis in, in this, the war in Ukraine uh, is an excellent example of that, and of the fact that cooperation between Europe, Japan, and the U.S. is global in scope. So uh, very much looking forward to uh, discussing the opportunities and challenges ahead for the partnership between Europe, uh, Japan, and the US. Uh, and uh, hopefully this trilateral dialogue will be the first of many more to come. And I think to address all these questions, we've got a terrific, uh, terrific lineup. And uh, without further ado, I'll just hand over to my uh, colleague and friend, Pierre Morcos, who is gonna moderate the discussion. Thank you. Thank you so much, Luis and Max, for these uh, 
kind remarks. Uh, my name is Pierre Morcos. I'm a visiting fellow with the Europe, Russia, and the Russia program here at CSIS, and welcome to this CSIS CSDS joint event on US Europe Japan cooperation in the Indo Pacific. To discuss this fascinating topic, we have a stellar panel which will provide us perspectives from Brussels, Tokyo, and Washington on this issue. First, let me introduce you to Dr. Eva Pelsova, who is a senior Japan fellow at the Center for Security, Diplomacy, and Strategy, CSDS of the Brussels School of Governance, but also an associate fellow at the French Fondation pour la Recherche Stratégique. Then we have the pleasure to have Professor Yuichi Hosoya, who is a professor of international politics at the Keio University in Tokyo, but also holds many think tank positions in renowned uh, Japanese think tanks. Finally, we have the pleasure to have Dr. Michael Green joining us on the screen, who is a well-known senior vice president for Asia and the Japan chair at CSIS and the director of Asia Studies at Georgetown University. Thank you for the three of you to join us. So we're here to discuss the potential for trilateral cooperation between Europe, the US, and Japan in the Indo-Pacific. We know that all three actors have developed their own visions for the region. They share the same values, the same objectives, but also the same desire to cooperate together. And it has been striking to see the intensification of the cooperation between uh, each of these actors over the past few months, with the US and Europe launching their own Indo-Pacific dialogue, with President Biden visiting Tokyo in a couple of, of weeks for a bilateral summit and a quarters leader, quarters, uh, quad leaders meeting. And finally, uh, an EU-Japan summit in a couple of weeks also in Tokyo. But the missing piece seems to be a true trilateral cooperation between these three actors, and we're here today to explore the prospect uh, for that. But let me begin by a broad question to the three of you. Uh, what is your sense of the convergence between these three actors when it comes to their strategic visions for the Indo-Pacific region? And maybe, uh, Dr. Eva Pescheva, you could start. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Pierre. And I should uh, start by um, you know, saying that I'm sincerely uh, grateful and, and, and thrilled to be here and to be having this conversation. So many thanks to, to CSIS for hosting this event. Um, because, uh, well, over the past year, at least uh, as part of the Japan program at the CSDS, we actually saw a particular value of, of exploring this trilateral dynamic uh, as, as, a, as part of furthering actually EU-Japan ties in the first place. So we've held a dialogue with, uh, or a trialogue with Australia, with India, with ASEAN. So obviously the United States um, should have perhaps come first because it seems that it's, it's clearly one of the most valuable uh, or perhaps the most valuable uh, combination in here. Um, and I personally actually think that there is a high potential that has been greatly underdeveloped still. Uh, and I couldn't agree more that with our uh, two opening uh, remarks uh, that the time is ripe. I think that there is a very particular political momentum that has been uh, driven, I'd say, chiefly by three transformations, I would say. Um, the first is the transformation of the EU as such. Uh, as a geopolitical actor in Asia and, and globally, but mostly in Asia. We'll, we'll talk about the strategy in a bit. Um, the second transformation is the EU-Japan one, and, and that's the one that I've been looking at uh, more uh, closely, but, but that's a really great leap forward that we can observe over the last five, but even more, two years ago. And the third is um, the deeply transformative effect that the Ukraine crisis has had uh, on, on, um, at the systemic level level, if you want, on kind of democratic coalitions uh, and, and the things that we can do uh, together. But uh, coming from the European perspective, I really think there has been a, a bit of an awakening moment that we talk about since roughly 2016, but even more so, um, let's say, since 2019 where uh, Europe realized, and, and it's been often quoted, uh, that Asian um, security uh, is something that we depend on, that European prosperity is dependent on Asian security, and therefore Europe should be proactively watching it and be a player. Um, the second awakening is China. Uh, 
China has been for the longest time uh, seen as a kind of a distant opportunity more than a challenge and frankly that has been a little bit of an obstacle in, in furthering this trilateral uh, cooperation because uh, Europe was seen as being too close to Beijing uh, from Washington and even from Tokyo uh, at, on the one hand and, and seen from you know uh, other Asian countries it was just being too close to the, to the United States so what it has to add. So having a Europe that is more mature as a geopolitical actor is, is, is important because suddenly we have a partner that is worthy uh, to work with, both for Japan and for the United States. Um, so this whole you know, idea of having a not just geopolitical actor, but a more independent, uh, far from talking about strategic autonomy that we talk a lot, uh, a lot about, but yes, it is now the publication of a strategic compass. We now have an Indo-Pacific strategy that we waited for uh, a long time, yeah. we can talk about it uh, a little bit more later, but Europe is a partner and an independent partner to work with. The second transformation is, is, is really the EU-Japan ties, uh, taking off uh, significantly under, under uh, Prime Minister Abe's with, of course, 2018, the Strategic Partnership Agreement, the Economic Partnership Agreement, Connectivity Partnership later on, and in three days, the EU-Japan digital uh, partnership that should be signed at the EU-Japan summit. And again, we talked about it a little bit this morning, um, the Ukrainian uh, crisis has accelerated the, the diplomatic connections between the two in a, in a rather amazing way um, and has given an extra impetus uh, to, to the bilateral but also trilateral uh, relationship. And never the, the, the perception threat uh, has never been so um, close, if you want, between the through and in a way it really bridges uh, the Indo-Pacific and the European theater as, as we discussed uh, quite extensively this, this morning. Uh, everyone has been surprised to see the, the Japanese uh, reaction to the crisis. Uh, I think the European reaction to the crisis was uh, you know, demonstrating that we can move beyond rhetorics, which is uh, something that Europeans have been quite you know, criticized most of the time, that we're from Venus, that we talk too much, but here we are trying to actually move on with things. Um, and yeah, so I believe that there is basically a unique momentum that sticks us together and we should definitely definitely use it. And we can perhaps discuss afterwards uh, how mm -hmm. exactly, but yeah. yeah we'll to get into with, to yeah. the details indeed uh, later on. Uh, thank you, Eva. Uh, Professor Hosoya, what is the Japanese perspective about Europe growing engagement in the Indo-Pacific region and how is, do you see a form of convergence between the strategies and to what extent? Well, thank you very much indeed, uh, Pierre, for your kind introduction and a good question. And I'm particularly uh, glad to be with both Eva and Mike, uh, two uh, great strategic thinkers and great experts on Asia and Japan. And uh, I'm particularly glad to talk on this topic because trilateral cooperation among three, uh, United States, Europe, and Japan, is much more vital than before. Uh, in a time of the crisis, in a time of transformation, because uh, we are, I mean, we all three are in defensive, and we are often talking about the recession of democracies, liberal democracies, and also we are talking about the rise of authoritarian regimes. So the Ukrainian war more or less symbolizes this trend, whether the authoritarian regime can win over uh, democracy, I mean Ukraine, you know, further, uh, the solidarity among liberal democracy can effectively respond to this challenge. So we are tested and we need to present good answer to that challenge. And I will focus on Japanese role and the Japanese policy or strategy uh, resp in responding to these challenges. First, I want, to, I want to talk about how Japan values the tri trilateral cooperation among the three in facing this war. And then I will also like to talk about how Japan has been promoting trilateral cooperation in Japan's free and open Indo-Pacific vision. First, uh, when we think about trilateral cooperation, we have to realize that there is no such real concrete entity of trilateral cooperation. It's a kind of a collection of three bilateral cooperations. Cooperation 
between Japan and the United States, cooperation between Japan and the EU, and Transatlantic Alliance, Transatlantic Cooperation. If we assemble these three bilateral corporations, we can see the reality of trilateral corporations. But we may be necessary to uh, create much more powerful, much more a robust trilateral cooperation in the time of crisis. And the weakest link was EU-Japan relations because EU and Japan were much less globalized power, much less influential power in international politics. Unlike the United States, the United States has been truly global player and a powerful influential player. So the point is whether Japan can catch up both United States and EU in influencing global politics. And after Abe administration, I think that the Japan has been trying to respond to the necessity of fulfilling uh, responsibility in the international community. And to do that, I think that the combination of Abe administration, Suga's administration, and Kishida's administration is important because Kishida's administration is even upgrading Japanese role in international community. There are two pillars, as far as I see, in Kishida's administration's foreign policy. Two pillars are human right diplomacy and economic sanction. So it would be natural to see that Kishida's administration's response to the Ukrainian war uh, is much more robust than we originally expected. Uh, Kishida, Prime Minister Kishida sided with other leading democratic countries in sanctioning Russia, including uh, uh, excluding Russia from SWIFT uh, financial cooperation. And also, uh, Japan decides to uh, present very critical voice uh, on Russian invasion on Ukraine. And I like to cite what Prime Minister Kishida said soon after Russian invasion. Uh, Prime Minister Kishida said on February 25th, uh, the next day after Russian invasion began, he said, quote, that it is an infringement of Ukrainian sovereignty and the territorial integrity and constitutes a blatant violation of international law. As an act of that, uh, as an act that undermines the very foundation of the international order, it is unacceptable and I condemn it in the strongest terms, unquote. So, Kishida, Prime Minister Kishida's voice was much stronger than what Prime Minister, Prime Minister Abe said in 2014 when Russian government annexed Crimea and Peninsula because uh, at the time there was a hope that Japanese government could advance economic cooperation with Russia. So in that sense, I think that uh, Prime Minister Kishida took much stronger stance in sanctioning Russia in this current crisis. So in this sense, I think that uh, we can see some sort of transformation of Japanese foreign policy from the original Yoshida doctrine, which focuses on the importance of expanding Japanese economic interests to the current much more very oriented diplomacy. To understand deeply about this transformation, I recommend you to read Mike's newest book, The Lying Out Advantage. He wrote brilliantly on, yes, he has it in his screen. Uh, he, uh, I think, uh, profoundly uh, focus on the importance of transformation of Japanese diplomacy since Abe's administration. So to underst by, by understanding it, I think that Japan is trying to catch up the other two entities, United States and Europe, in consolidating uh, a, a cooperation among liberal democracies. So in the sense, I strongly uh, 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 like to focus on the current transformation of Japanese policy. And, and then I'd like to end my comment by saying that uh, it is also important to understand that uh, within each society, or within each country, we have our own weakness. We are much more divided than before in each country. And we see ideological confrontation in each country. And also, we see some doubts in each country on the future of liberal democracy. That's why we have to present the strength and the value of liberal democracy by ourselves to our audience, to our own people as well. So each country has homework. 
EU, Japan, the United States, each entity, each power has its own whole bank to present the strengths of liberal democracy. And also, we have to also present the strengths of our own economy, our own technology, our own society. To do that, we need more cooperation in technologies and digitalization and of course economic growth and so on. So in that sense, I think that we need more agenda to enhance the cooperation among the three bilateral corporations. Thank you so much, Professor Hosoya. Now let me turn to, to Mike. Um, uh, the Biden administration has recently released its own Indo-Pacific strategy, which is clearly uh, allies by design with a strong focus on, on the, the importance of partners and allies across the Indo-Pacific. Could you elaborate more on the specific expectations of, of Washington regarding Tokyo and Brussels when it comes to uh, promoting a free and open Indo-Pacific? Well, Thank you very much, Pierre. Um, ironically, I'm the CSIS guy on the panel and I'm not there, so apologies for that, but I, my schedule today is a little crazy. Um, so I think the Biden administration um, intends to uh, strengthen its alliance cooperation in the Indo-Pacific even beyond what the previous administrations had done and and wants to bring um, uh, more um, alignment between the U.S. and Europe after estrangement in the Trump administration. So those are their big ambitions. But honestly, I think that the real question is, what do Brussels and Tokyo want from the Biden administration? Because when you look at the Indo-Pacific strategy, it hits exactly the right conceptual framework for um, managing um, dramatic geopolitical change. and. Um, basically uh, protecting um, our values and our interests in an open uh, regional order free of coercion. It does all that, but it has two big weak points, which um, are areas where I think, frankly, Brussels and Tokyo um, w w can and should uh, be pushing the administration to do better. The first is trade. The free and open Indo-Pacific strategy makes reference to a Indo-Pacific Economic Framework, IPEF, which will be announced, uh, we expect, when President Biden goes to Japan later this month. But most people who have been following this, including our friends in Tokyo, uh, think that it's very thin, that it really doesn't include market access. It's pretty thin on, on rulemaking, a very poor substitute for the U.S. withdrawal from uh, the CPTPP. And I'm quite certain Prime Minister Kishida um, and others in the region will be telling Joe Biden, this is great, this is a first step, it's not enough. And then the second area, frankly, is when you read the um, Indo-Pacific um, strategy, which is a well-constructed document overall, it, it lacks a longer-term vision for how the United States will live with China. Uh, what does the United States think about investments in China? Uh, should we be protecting our businesses or getting them to pull out? What do we think about cooperating with China on uh, areas uh, in the Indo-Pacific, not just climate change or North Korea, but in Southeast Asia? These are areas where there is no consensus within the administration and, frankly, no appetite to say something right before a midterm election in the U.S. that will feature a lot of um, pretty, pretty tough, appropriately tough um, political rhetoric about China. Um, when you look at the EU strategic documents, or in Japan, most recently, the Liberal Democratic Party's strategic vision, they're premised on pushing back against Chinese coercion, protecting our values and interests, writing the economic rules, but not decoupling from China. And while the U.S. Indo-Pacific strategy doesn't explicitly call for decoupling, it's just a great big empty space in the strategy that's going to be filled, I think, with um, intensive dialogue with Japan especially, with our other Asian allies and with Europe. So there, th there's homework uh, on the U.S. side. And let me just quickly, um, just quickly um, uh, pick up on the excellent comments from uh, Yuichi and Eva. I, I think they're right on target. Yes, um, Chinese coercion, the Ukraine crisis, Japan-EU diplomacy has all explained this transformation. But I would actually go even one step further and say what explains this transformation is Japanese leadership, Japanese thought leadership. It was Japan that held, and Abe, that held the G7 together, not only in the Trump years, but during friction in the Obama years. Um, it's Japan that has started to define earlier than anyone what digital trade should look like. The EU-Japan Digital Trade Agreement, IPEF, it's Japan that's pushing hardest for um, global rules uh, driven from the conning tower of the U.S. 
from Brussels, Tokyo, and Washington. Um, it's Japan that stepped up and led on the G7 uh, a punishment of Vladimir Putin, but also reached out to the other Asian countries and Global South, and Japan that brought Taiwan into the G7 dialogue. So I agree with everything that was said, but I, I, I think we may want to give even more credit than we have uh, to Tokyo for actually being um, the thought leader that's holding together the transatlantic relationship in many ways, not just catching up, but actually moving us all forward together. Thank you, Mike. Um, now I would like to, to zoom in and, and discuss with you uh, concrete area, areas where there could be uh, a trilateral cooperation between uh, the US, uh, Europe, and Japan. Um, and I think it's important to have a pragmatic approach and think about tangible issues where we could foster this cooperation and also think about the framework of such uh, cooperation. Uh, Professor Hosoya, you mentioned that for the moment we have a collection of three bilateral uh, cooperations. Uh, how can we uh, go a, a, a step further and think about a trilateral uh, format? So, so maybe you could pick one or two areas where we could have a, a, a greater trilateral at all corporations where there is the most promising uh, uh, potential. Uh, Eva, maybe if you can, yeah. can start with um, you. Uh, just kind of more generally on, on, on cooperation before I get mm -hmm. to the areas, but I think um, there's two strengths. There's the political strength and there's the practical one. At the political level, I think it's, it's, it's a matter also just to, not necessarily to cooperate, but to coordinate, to, to know who is doing what, to be able afterwards to you know address the complementarities and, and, and figure out something uh, together. And, and that has been missing. And obviously, of course, administrations are, I mean, it, it is an institutional problem as well uh, if an administration is working on Asia who you know why your department should be actually discussing with Europe etc I mean and that's a problem with all administrations but just to have a regular um, you know established uh, connection link working phone line kind of a working habit mechanism just to, to keep each other's um, informed about what you're about to do how you're engaging with the third parties etc I think would be you know a very basic nice uh, first step. When it comes to uh, the practical level, uh, I, was, I was very pleased to hear this morning uh, Kurt Campbell's uh, remarks because he mentioned uh, the, the new US effort uh, to, to listen to, to our Asian colleagues. Um, which is something that on the European side we've tried to do for a long time and, and to precisely focus on, on some of those functional security issues that many disregard as being too mundane and, and, and too, you know, not, not as a matter of big strategic interests such as illegal fishing, uh, such as uh, maritime domain awareness, um, uh, law enforcement at sea, and that's just from the maritime security demand. So if you would, you know, uh, ask me one domain, then clearly maritime security is one. but it's not about necessarily having a trilateral joint exercise. We can't, we, we certainly can. I mean, we had three joint exercises with Japan and it's great, it's great to, to talk interoperability, it's great to work on it, but it can be also, you know, these areas. So this morning, just to, to recap for those who have not listened, uh, Kurt Campbell's um, remarks, we, we talked about the Pacific Islands and we talked about the need to, to improve maritime domain awareness. And it, frankly, to, to me, it was, it was music to my ears because this is exactly what the EU has been doing for many years and in fact it's an area in which it has been recognized and very much appreciated by you know a, a lot of Asian partners in the Indian Ocean uh, region and something that we've been trying to expose because it's an area that is very much demanding on, in multilateral cooperation so if there is something that uh, Europe can bring to the table. It is, of course, the you know the, the nitty gritty, uh, boring, um, multilateral way of of uh, dealing with things. And where else than in maritime security? Uh, a second area, I would say, well, at least from the European perspective, anything that deals with norm setting, either digital, of course, and that's a big area. I think that will take off between uh, with the EU, Japan, but also. Uh, with the US, digital, uh, green transition, all these uh, norm setting in, 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 in those areas that really need to be um, governed by, by norms. And again, that's something that the EU can bring to the table. Um, 
Yeah, there's quite a few. I would say connectivity, addressing the global south. These are all the things that we discussed this morning that I really think that need to be need to be uh, approached in coordination at least. So connectivity really, again, is, is a very broad topic. Uh, all three partners work uh, or have their own connectivity strategy pretty much in the same area, ranging you know, from Southeast Asia to South Asia to Africa, all over the place. So yeah, a minimum would be to, to have a, a kind of a reliable uh, coordination mechanism to see that we are not stepping on each other's toes um, and that we create together a sort of a healthy competitive environment when it comes to the uh, connectivity or investments in, in, in infrastructure in those regions that we you know lift the tide and, and are not uh, leaving it all to the Belt and Road and, and to China in that sense so it's um, yeah if, if I pick three then it would be those three great shows and thank you for for your for your detailed answer uh, professor Hosaya yes uh First of all, uh, we have seen in the last several years uh, the decoupling between the United States and China. You know, many business companies in Japan, United States, and Europe have some concerns, show some concerns, and in which area they have to change their attitude in their business, and uh, because these are not very clear so far. So the decoupling has been targeted and partial, but we do not know clear lines of those partiality or those targets. So first of all, uh, the three parties, the United States and Japan and the European Union, need to coordinate their policies. And between the United States and Japan, last year in April, Prime Minister Suga and President Biden agreed to launch a new initiative of DFFT, uh, sorry, a, a new initiative of core partnership. Core partnership focused on the importance of enhancing both a competitiveness and resilience by the two countries, United States and Japan. And this is a quite important initiative, and this kind of concept and the initiative should be shared by all the three parties, and like connectivity strategy as well. Both EU and Japan share important strategy of connectivity. That's why they can collaborate to link each sub-regions. And also, the concept of FOIP, is also shared by the three parties, United States, Japan, and the European Union. So there are many important initiatives, and uh, I think the important thing is these initiatives should be shared by all the three and to be fully understood. And there are some other minilateral initiatives such as AUKUS, AUKUS, and so on. These minilateral cooperation can both enhance or endanger tolerate cooperation. And I think that the reaction of President Biden soon after the launch of AUKUS to explain to President Macron was very good initiative, not to maintain some of the doubts among Europeans or among French people. And soon after the ex ex explanation by President Biden, I think that uh, President Macron or European people have much clear understanding about why the United States uh, felt it necessary to launch a new initiative. So these new initiatives should be shared by the, all the three and should be fully understood among the three and should be coordinated among themselves. And DFFT, Data Free, Fra Free Flow with Trust, is another example. There are many new important initiatives among the three uh, by, by each players. And I think that one of the important things uh, is that there are three different bilateral relations, bilateral cooperation. That's why we need to see the coordination among the three individual uh, bilateral cooperation. Thank you. Uh, Mike, let, let me turn to you. Uh, if you had to pick up one or two areas where Japan, US, and Europe should coordinate more the actions or even cooperate, what would there be? Well, um, technology competition has to be high on the list, but we have to be realistic about what areas um, are ripe for cooperation now and what will take more time. Digital trade is going to be very, very important, um, but, but I, I think that the U.S.-European uh, relationship is too fraught with disagreements over the nature of big tech, uh, privacy, and so forth. 
for us to be effective standard setters uh, early on. I think that's going to be a, a Japan dialogue with the EU and a Japan dialogue and other U.S. allies with the U.S. through IPEF, Indo-Pacific Economic Framework. And in time, frankly, the transatlantic relationship will catch up with the Europe-Japan, uh, U.S.-Japan relationship. But there are other areas in technology where the U.S. and Europe um, uh, and Japan can move quite quickly. So one would be 5G. Um, how do we regulate access to 5G? How do we create um, no, uh, regulatory standards for a uh, 5G um, uh, policy across democracies that protects our infrastructure and our civil liberties? Um, and another would be investment screening. Um, how do we make sure we have consistency uh, in our strategic uh, screening of foreign direct investments, particularly from China, but but that, that don't actually catch US, Japan, EU investments. So those are two ripe areas within technology, but others like digital trade, even within the US, there's, there's not a consensus on this. Within the White House, there's not a consensus on this. That will take more time, even though it is very important. Um, another related area would be economic coercion. Um, China's um, embargo against Korea, against Australia, Canada, Lithuania, um, you know, initially countries like Korea or Australia um, or Canada wanted to handle these on their own. They didn't want help from other countries because they thought they could finesse the diplomacy with Beijing. I don't think that's the mood anymore. I think the next time we see significant economic embargoes or coercion by Beijing against uh, a, a democracy, um, the U.S., uh, EU, Japan, and other U.S. allies in Asia should be moving together. And to some extent, that's declaratory policy. To some extent, it may be countermeasures, but that's a menu that we really need to be examining because um, Beijing continues using this tool um, and uh, not paying a price for it other than reputationally. So this is an area where I think all three, uh, Brussels, Washington, and Tokyo, um, uh, can and should move pretty quickly. There are complexities. Um, we're wargaming these at CSIS. It's very hard to actually, for example, tell Americans don't buy, uh, don't export wine to China because we should help Australia. In a free market, it's hard to do some of these things, but other aspects, countermeasures and so forth, um, we should be developing as a toolkit together because we'll be more effective together. And so far, China's been picking off countries one at a time to punish. And we, we need to put a stop to that. Thank you, Mike. Uh, let me stay with you, and I would have a question about the initial lessons learned from the war in Ukraine on this trilateral cooperation in the, in the Indo-Pacific. Uh, the level of, of joint action between Tokyo, Brussels, and Washington on Ukraine and Russia has been quite remarkable in terms of uh, coordinated sanctions, uh, joint cooperation on energy to help Europeans uh, phasing out from uh, their dependence on Russian oil and gas. But what about potential lessons learned from their cooperation in the Indo-Pacific? Uh, would you have thoughts on, on this, uh, Mike? It's a really good question, Pierre. And I think you know the silver lining of the Ukraine crisis is the remarkable degree of solidarity among leading democracies on all sides of the globe, which you can be sure came as a shock to Putin, but it also came as a shock to Xi Jinping. And uh, China is aligning with Russia, but it's not allying with Russia. Um, uh, Xi Jinping is doing whatever he can to prevent Russia's failure, uh, as long as those measures don't expose China or Chinese companies to sanctions or um, SWIFT. Uh, sanctions or things like that. Uh, but the alignment is quite clear and I think shocking to Europeans. Um, so the Ukraine crisis has created this enormous um, demonstration effect that free uh, people, that democratic governments, certainly the advanced ones, will come together if there's a global crisis. This is helpful for Europe and helpful for NATO. And as I said, Japan has really stepped up and has led and set an example for other key um, Asian uh, players like, uh, like Singapore and Korea and Australia. Um, and um, uh, by the same token, in the Western Pacific, as I heard from the Taiwanese leadership when I was there uh, about a month ago, this has demonstrated how important Europe is to the security of Taiwan, Japan, Korea, Australia. Um, not, not because NATO will dispatch large numbers of forces, not because of the military deterrent, but because of the dissuasion effect, the, the, the fact that global solidarity against um, 
unprovoked and illegal aggression, that this can impose a major geopolitical and economic cost on a country. Putin's finding that. And it's more difficult with China. China's more, we are more interdependent with China than we are with Russia. But by the same token, China is therefore more vulnerable um, to any degree of uh, punishment or decoupling. And uh, I could see that happening on the technology front, for example, should China use force. So um, th this is very, very powerful as a dissuader, um, uh, as something that will complicate Chinese planning about when and how it can use force. That said, we we've not really thought about it very much, and we do need to have more dialogue um, trilaterally about how we think about the lessons of Ukraine for dissuading um, uh, future um, actions or potential actions uh, against uh, against the next Ukraine. We have to talk about what this toolkit means, but I think the whole world can see that it's potentially there, which is very, very powerful. Hmm. Thank you, Mike. Uh, Professor Hosaya, will you have comments on the potential lessons learned for the Indo-Pacific uh, theater? Yes, I think that so far in the last several years, I'm glad to see that uh, there are more solidarity among the three. Like last year, the UK government dispatched uh, carrier strike groups to 21 together with American fleets and Dutch fleet. And this shows the solidarity among the three, I mean the United States, Japan, and the European countries, in trying to resist to encroachment of Chinese uh, uh, activity around the area both Taiwan Straits and Senkaku and so on. So uh, uh, maybe a decade before, it seems to many Japanese people that sometimes Europe was sided with China by focusing on the importance of historical issues because China rejected the argument that, that Senkaku Islands on Taiwan issue are not a uh, security issue or a geopolitical issue. But China was arguing that these are historical issues. Historical issues, that's why China was criticizing Japan that Japan was once again trying to invade China or to try a war or something. But now many people fully understand that this is a geopolitical sovereignty issue. And we need to uh, prevent the uh, force for a, a, a change of status quo by China. So uh, we have seen new situation in which uh, China is much more advantageous in uh, global uh, balance of power and regional balance of power, particularly in the area. And uh, uh, with much stronger uh, solidarity among United States, Japan, and Europe, I think that it will be more difficult for China to try to change the status quo around the area. So this is a very good move, and we need to maintain, even though we see, we have seen the rapid rise of Chinese military power, but still, uh, we need to resist to any encroachment of, uh, uh, by, by China around the area, particularly in the Taiwan Strait and the Senkaku Islands. Thank you. Eva, will you have those? It's, it's difficult to add uh, more to, to what Mike and, and, and uh, Jose has already said, but um, in general, well, of course, I agree with the, with the solidarity, with the, with the kind of you know, tightening uh, coalitions between the democracies that we all talked about. What I found interesting is the kind of deeply emotional impact that this uh, crisis had uh, across the world, really. I mean, it's, it's not every time that you see uh, regular, among the, the everyday population, pretty much everywhere and, and we're talking a lot about, about Japan where it resonates even more because of the kind of nuclear uh, potential it has but also in, in let's say rural areas in Myanmar and Vietnam which would be traditionally not necessarily anti-Russian countries quite the opposite but the whole uh, idea of having a, a big bully basically a, a big power bullying a smaller uh, is adding another dimension to to this uh, to this conflict, so it's not just about you know Russia versus or Russia or China versus a smaller, but it's also the big versus small, which really uh, resonates a lot uh, across the Indo-Pacific. So um, so yeah, it, there's probably a silver lining, I guess, in a in a kind of global more consciousness. Everyone, it's it's not um, it's it's leaving no one indifferent. It seems that it's appealing always uh, to to some part of population or to some countries in perhaps a different way. 
So uh, we talked about engaging with them, and I don't like the word global, global south or, or, or the third world really, but uh, the majority of those countries actually, or a big part of the countries that we saw on the United Nations vote map that you know was not red. Um, I really think that there is an important um, homework or, or soul searching or uh, coordination or we're talking about how to really engage better and communicate better because I think the momentum this crisis has really cre created also a momentum to change perhaps our own approach or communication with this part of the world and, and that's what the next playground is. Thank you Eva. Um, now I would like to explore with you the potential stumbling blocks in, in this trilateral cooperation and maybe discuss the areas where there is still divergence between these three actors and where there is not enough maturity to have a clear coordination or cooperation. Uh, I, I think that Mike already mentioned the, 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 the trade issue, but there might be others. Uh, maybe Eva, if we could start with you about potential hurdles in, in this cooperation. I'm starting to think. Um, I know when we were discussing informal, we mentioned Taiwan, but I'm actually not sure if really that is such a big stumbling block. I think it's it may be a perceived difference, at least uh, you know at the transatlantic level. I think it's just that perhaps on the Europe we talk about it less. Uh, but when you see um, the position, you know, really has changed a lot over the last couple of years. We see the European Parliament being extremely vocal and supportive of the Taiwanese cause. Um, we see the EU supporting the Lithuanian uh, case at the WTO, for instance. I really think that there, that part of, of European policy is changing um, dramatically as is deteriorating also the, the public image of China in, in Europe. So that's kind of proportionate to that. Um, obviously, uh, what Mike said about the trade and technology that, that may be, uh, you know, the, the, the something that needs to be solved at the bilateral level uh, with, uh, with the United States. Not sure if that's something that can be your problem should be addressed at the at the trilateral level. Um, yeah, so that that's probably it. Professor Hosaya? Yes, uh, generally speaking, I feel that each country is not quite ready to sacrifice their own each national interest or economic business interest to 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 support some of the important principles in international order. So they are opposing Russian invasion, and they are criticizing Chinese violation of human rights, uh, like Uyghur and Xinjiang and so on. But uh, at the same time, they are not quite ready, it seems, to, to, to sacrifice their own interest uh, by, by sanctioning quite deeply and effectively in some areas. But on the other hand, I have some hope and I, I see some quite a, 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 a new movement in the last several months. Like, uh, unlike my previous expectation, the European Union radically changed its energy policy to try to reduce its dependence on Russian natural resources. Uh, it's quite deep and radical. And uh, the first day, German government didn't really like to uh, radically transformed the previous policy towards Russia. But because of the very, very strong criticism from within, in a day or two, German government uh, rapidly uh, uh, transformed its own policy towards Russia. So uh, we have seen some of the new moves. And as I said, uh, Kishida's administration is quite radical in changing previous Japanese policy towards China or towards Russia by sacrificing some of Japanese economic and business interests with China and you know, with Russia, because Kishida administration fully value uh, the importance of basic principles in international order. Uh, so that's why I think that uh, EU and Japan are trying to, uh, ready more is, to sacrifice some of the important economic and business interests to support 
a rule-based international order or to support, to defend some of the important principles in international order. So this is a new rule, but still, there are so many countries which are not quite ready to sacrifice their own interests. And there will be very strong criticism with, from within if the government or political leader decides to radically change or radically damage some of the interests of each country. So it has to have a very strong political foundation and it has to have a very effective strategic communication to persuade their own people. Otherwise, while criticizing each action of Russia or China, but still they maintain, they, or they tend to maintain the previous policy in maintaining a very strong, deep economic business relationship with both Russia and China. So this is a big challenge, but I have seen some of the bright sides of new changes in each country. Thank you. Mike, let me turn to you. Yeah, I, I would say overall, agreeing with Eva and with Yuichi, the trend lines um, are positive for trilateral US, EU, Japan cooperation. I think one underlying, um, perhaps subtle difference though, between Japan and Europe is the question of American primacy. I, 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 I think polls indicate very clearly and policies indicate clearly that for Japan or for Korea or Australia, um, American primacy itself is essential. And I think in Europe, there's still pockets of um, uh, ambivalence, of uh, dislike of American hip hop puissance, so whatever it is. Um, and that matters because um, we had a rough patch when Donald Trump was president and Japan stepped in, Abe stepped in to sort of hold up the G7, make the case for not um, isolating Donald Trump as much as he deserved it. And we could get that again. So um, there is this difference between, I think, the Japanese and European view of the global order. Yes, there should be more trilateral cooperation, but I think the Japanese view primarily is still that American preeminence is critical. And, um, and for now, it doesn't show up as an issue, but it could again, which is the second um, problem we have, which is not a problem for Japan, but in the US and Europe, we still have the possibility of a of an ethno-nationalistic or populist leader coming in who disagrees with everything we're saying. Um, you know, Donald Trump was fundamentally opposed to the European experiment, opposed to European integration. He, he famously told European leaders that Europe was worse than China. Um, we could have a leader like that again. We, we uh, if I, I mean, if you don't mind me interfering in European affairs, if Marine Le Pen had been elected in France, we would have had a much harder time uh, building uh, the kind of cooperation we're talking about, especially um, with NATO. And um, other European capitals could be prone to this too. Japan, not so much. Japan's blessed with a pretty stable, if boring, political system right now. Populism didn't work in 2009 and 10 with Hatoyama, and it, seems the Japanese public doesn't want to try again. But that populist uh, sort of backlash against what we're talking about is, uh, is a not insignificant um, a problem we might encounter in the future. So those are two things that, that worry me a little bit. And then the last thing I'd say is we do have to figure out how we operationalize our, our common recognition that democracy around the world is under threat. And we aren't on the same page. For the democracy summit that President Biden hosted, uh, I was told 90% of the coordination was with Europe and about 10% with the American allies in Asia uh, and the rest of the world. And in Asia, there's a slightly different view of how you handle democracy issues. But the bottom line is we need to work together um, and decide how we will deal with um, issues like um, what's happening in Myanmar, um, how we um, coordinate our efforts to support governance and democracy in countries. We've all awoken to our common interest in defending democracy, but we've not taken that next stage and figured out how we operationalize that, or at least coordinating what we each do. Thank you, Mike. Uh, let me ask a, a final question on my end, and then I, I will uh, open to questions from the audience. Um, it was already mentioned, but the, the, the question of Taiwan um, and all the flashpoints such as the Senkaku Islands or the South China Sea or North Korea, um, 
what are the expectations of Washington uh, regarding Europe when it comes to these uh, high intensity scenarios? Uh, you, you mentioned in an earlier uh, panel the need for joint contingency, uh, joint planning to, to prepare ourselves for such uh, scenarios. Could you elaborate on that, on, on the expectations of Washington towards uh, Europe? Um, if, if Europe, and particularly if the major economies in Europe, uh, demonstrate uh, a, a, a willingness to take some risk to preserve the international order, um, uh, demonstrate that they value democracy, um, uh, sending the Queen Elizabeth and the Charles de Gaulle to the Indo-Pacific region, uh, knowing that China won't like it, but, but wanting to show the flag, um, including uh, support for um, uh, Taiwan's uh, democracy and for security and stability in the Taiwan Strait in U.S.-EU joint statements or bilateral statements. All those things strongly suggest to Beijing that um, the Chinese use of force against Taiwan, which, by the way, would almost necessarily involve Chinese use of force against Japan and the United States, um, that, that Europe is going to take some risk and that the kind of economic and geopolitical consequences Putin's facing at some level would confront China. That's a very, very powerful element that complicates Chinese planning about how easily they can use force against Taiwan. Very, very important. But it does another thing which people don't think about. The more um, Taipei and leaders in Taipei are talking not only to the United States, but and not only to Japan, but to, to, to European capitals, not in an official diplomatic sense. We're all, you know, we're all living under a one China policy, but in a really deep substantive sense, exchanging views. The more um, the more leaders in Taiwan see that to some extent they've not seen before leaders in Europe, not just in the U.S. and Japan, um, have a stake in Taiwan's being free from coercion and, uh, and, and have some sympathy with Taiwan's democracy. The more the leaders see that in Taiwan, the more incentivized they will be to not change the status quo. I, I was dispatched to Taiwan with other former officials uh, right after the uh, Russian attack on Ukraine to reassure and listen to uh, our friends in Taipei. And it, it, my very strong impression was that this global support for Ukraine indicated to the Taiwanese leadership that that they need Europe support, and and for that reason they should not they do not have an incentive to unilaterally change the status quo to provoke China. So you get two things from greater U.S. Uh, US EU and Japanese engagement on the Taiwan issue. You complicate. Beijing's planning if they have ill designs, but you also reaffirm and reassure for Taiwan that staying steady, not provoking, not changing unilaterally the status quo are all smart strategy. So it, it really is that, I think, that Washington um, and the administration would like to see from Brussels, but, but from other capitals uh, across Europe as well. Thank you, Mike. Uh, Professor Hosoya, what are the expectations from Tokyo when it comes to EU's role in, in such scenarios? Right. Uh, well, if I link the question to Taiwan's issue, I felt that this is very important in a sense that the question is closely related to the question of American primacy that Mike previously mentioned. Because uh, after the war, the trust of Taiwanese people on American uh, commitment to Taiwan defense has been dropped to 40%. But previously, before the war, the rate was support, uh, public opinion poll in Taiwan shows that more than 60% of, of Taiwanese people basically expected American engagement in or commitment to Taiwanese defense. So it means that many people in Taiwan, I felt, thought that the United States would not come to help Taiwan in the case of a crisis in Taiwan, particularly if a Chinese government is trying to uh, use the rhetoric of nuclear escalation maybe it would be possible that American president or American government official says that, would say that United States is doing everything to avoid nuclear war with China. So the, 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 I think that the Chinese government is watching 
how Russian government is trying to use the rhetoric of nuclear escalation to deny American engagement in the region. So many people say that uh, we, there are clear distinction and differences between the defense of Ukraine and the defense of Taiwan. But at the same time, I think that the China has been learning so many things to try to deny or reject American involvement in the region. And nuclear escalation can be a useful tool to persuade American people uh, to, 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 to take a distance from uh, crisis or war in Asia. And the second thing is that uh, I have been feeling that in the last one or two years, particularly, Chinese government has been brilliantly uh, successful in undermining American moral leadership, uh, particularly in the years of trans administration, and also uh, last year's January 6th incident in the introduction to American Congress. Uh, there are several in, in, uh, cases that the uh, Chinese government or Chinese media have been utilizing to undermine American moral leadership in the world. By using these examples, I think that they try to convince Japanese people, or other Asian people, or European people that the United States is not the appropriate country or power to lead the world from the point of view of moral leadership. So uh, it is really necessary, I feel, that the United States need to repair or uh, rebuild more leadership in the world, because uh, in the last one or two, de two decades, many people in the world see that the United States has been damaging by, its, by, by herself its own moral leadership in the world. So uh, uh, having considered these uh, uh, factors, I think that in Asia, there are more people who cannot fully really trust American commitment to the peace and the security in the region. So I think that the Japan should also play an important role to convince people in Japan or elsewhere in Asia that the United States is a hope to maintain the peace and the stability in the region, not the country which destroyed the stability and the peace in the region. Thank you. Uh, Eva, could you tell us if there is an appetite in Europe to think about Taiwan and how they could support uh, Taiwan uh, one way or another in, in a situation of, of crisis? Well, um, as I said, I think it's, it's already, uh, already happening uh, very much and it is very much proportionate to, to the kind of decline in, in the perception of the European uh, public of, uh, of China, which really took a, um, a hard um, uh, you know, um, hit uh, during the COVID crisis and with uh, the emergence of the wolf warrior diplomacy, etc. But it's interesting, actually, if we look at some of the surveys, um, when we talk about this, you know, drastic decline of, of uh, or worsening of public opinion towards China, it's actually still on a global scale. It's actually still quite positive in some countries. You know, we're still kind of around 40 percent of the population thinking rather positively about China in some of the countries, which is, uh, you know, of course, comparing to the US or Japan um, on, on a rather positive note. But I think it's, um, it, it's really changing. Uh, it has uh, a lot to do not just with the sort of diplomatic uh, style that has been criticized over the last couple of years, and of course, um, some hardcore evidence of, of Chinese kind of greater interference into um, European political uh, affairs, um, but also to the disappointment of uh, some of the initiatives. Uh, we've talked uh, quite a lot about the 16 plus one, or 17 and minus one. So now back to 16 plus one initiative, uh, which has uh, hugely uh, under-delivered. Uh, so that has been, you know, the usual divide between, let's say, the kind of Eastern European countries or Central European countries being uh, more prone to support China, which really is not that much the case uh, later on um, and if you look at the figures actually the investments from Taiwan have been much more important than from mainland China and, and this is something that that's simply a reality that uh, a lot of the European audience is, is waking up um, so I think that's about to change to what extent uh, or how far it will go of course depends on, on you know that's that's a question for any any country um, but uh, I think the 
the Lithuanian case that I very briefly mentioned already is uh, is a good example uh, of of the bloc being able uh, and willing to to step up uh, in front of a major you know dispute settlement mechanism um, for a small country uh, that is one of the smallest in um, in, in Europe. So um, I'm, I'm have quite high hopes and I myself come from a very small country that um, at some point uh, a year or two almost two years ago stepped out stood out uh, in, in, in defense of, uh, of Taiwan so yeah I think there is uh, there is definitely hope but uh, just to follow up what um, uh, Jose has said just said on, on uh, Chinese uh, on the earlier question on China's effort to kind of undermine the uh, or question the morality or, or legitimacy of the US uh, um, leadership, I think we're onto something there. Um, and, and we hear similar, uh, not only that it may work, uh, of course, in front of uh, some audience, but we hear similar, um, in a similar vein, if you want, China has been always uh, very vocally supporting uh, European strategic autonomy, for instance. Uh, and, and we have this kind of seduction campaigns, uh, you know, that, that very much go uh, along the same line. And, and the whole point is really to decouple or to, to drive a wedge uh, into the transatlantic uh, relationship. And we really need to be more aware about it and, and, and kind of bring it back also, well, at least on the European side to the national level so that everyone is aware about it. Um, because one of the challenges in Brussels is, of course, that we are also very much bottom up. So, uh, you know, when we get messages from the national level saying, you know, but the Chinese support the European strategic autonomy, why should we not, you know, take it more for, uh, for granted and, you know, take it as a positive sign, then we should really be more cautious and, and of course, uh, you know, ignore it or, or, or not let um, the, the wedge to be driven. Mm. No, that's a very good point and indeed we have experienced quite an aggressive rhetoric coming from China in Europe. It has sometimes uh, become, become counterproductive and have pushed Europeans to be together and, and, and join their forces against, against Beijing. So but it is an interesting uh, uh, dynamic. Um, let me end with, with, a, with a question from the audience from the Waseda University. Uh, maybe to, to you, Professor uh, uh, Osaya. Uh, it is, it, it is in questioning what are the areas of overlap uh, with others, many lateral arrangements that need to be addressed. So a question about maybe the uh, increasing existence of these mini lateral formats and the risk of overlapping, if not uh, competition, between these different mini lateral formats in the Indo-Pacific. The, the, the main question would be, I think it's an interesting, important question. The main, main point is whether the United States can show quite relevant, persuasive, long-term strategy fit, fit, we are sure, most of the allies of the United States. So uh, if AUKUS or Quad can be fitted to this long-term American strategy fit, can satisfy or reassure most of the allies, maybe that initiative can be quite well received or welcomed by most of majority of American allies. But if this is not the case, maybe the other allies show some anxiety about American will, why the United States is trying to use it. So uh, maybe we have not yet seen clear direction of American long-term strategy and uh, Unless we do not know where we are heading, it is difficult for American allies to be uh, very close to the United States. So uh, I don't know if the uh, American new national security strategy under the President Biden can show it. You know, I don't know whether uh, uh, th th this new move can be coincided with and fully uh, 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 harmonious with NATO's new strategy, strategic concept. If all of these strategic concepts and long-term strategy can fit in harmony, maybe uh, we can uh, have much more confidence in some of the American initiative like AUKUS or Quad and so on. So in a sense, I think that Japan can play a very important role in explaining and persuading the 
relevance and value of these initiatives such as Quad, where Japan joins in, to Asian countries. May, like FOIP, FOIP is basically welcomed by, AO, uh, by the ASEAN. Uh, initially, that move uh, brought some anxiety about, among ASEAN countries, but uh, after EO2, Japanese, uh, after the very uh, 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 important Japanese efforts, efforts by Japanese bureaucrats, officials, to pressure aid ASEAN member states, governments, on the necessity and the utility of the FOIP. So afterwards, in 2018, ASEAN launched its own version of uh, Indo-Pacific Strategy, AOIP, in harmony with Japanese FOIP. So I think that the Japanese role is important in persuading or explaining to Asian countries, governments, on the necessity of this move. But at the same time, I think that the United States needs to show its clear long-term strategy, uh, which can fully reassure allies where we are heading for. Thank you, Professor. So yeah, it's almost the end of our conversation. So I, I would like to, to give you an opportunity to give some final comments and maybe share with you your expectations about the upcoming important meetings in Tokyo with the visit of, of President Biden and then the EU-Japan summit. Uh, maybe let, let's start with you, uh, Mike. Well, I think um, in many ways, um, Prime Minister Kishida is in the driver's seat as the uh, host for President Biden and then um, the main interlocutor for the EU-Japan summit. And so uh, I, I think Prime Minister Kishida is demonstrating a, a very clear vision for a world where democracies cooperate to invest in the resilience of countries that are subjected to elite capture or coercion, but also to uh, strengthen our common uh, defense and security. Um, and I, and I, and I, I think that's going to come through very clearly. The fact these two summits are having happening with Japan so closely together really does put Kishida in the driver's seat to start to have a, the kind of consistent signal that 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 Osoya Sensei was talking about. I do think we um, will see the Quad emphasized quite a bit. There's a summit for the Quad when the president's uh, in the region. Um, I think you'll hear him talk about AUKUS. Um, there's also the U.S.-Japan-Australia trilateral security. Uh, uh, relationship. And now I think uh, coming back will be U.S.-Japan-Korea with the new government in, in Korea. These are all um, uh, reinforcing security, but they're not yet collective security. So it's a delicate balancing act, and not all countries are happy about them. But at the end of the day, I think they do contribute to a more predictable uh, and stable free and open Indo-Pacific. Thank you, Mike. Eva, what are your expectations regarding the EU-Japan summit in a couple of weeks? Mm. I thought it's. Uh, I thought it's uh, just uh, around the corner. It's actually mm. next. This in three days, mm. right? Uh, well, I think it's it's uh, on a very good path, uh, as we saw in the in the last uh, well almost two months actually, or even longer. So I think uh, we can expect all the all the good things. And I'm looking forward to reading Mike's book because from what I've heard about it, it really seems that uh, we can stay assured that under Japan's leadership and especially now under uh, Prime Minister Kishida's. Uh, leadership we are we can basically you know all be confident and, and follow the the uh, Japan's um, lead on regional affairs um, but um, I just wanted to to conclude with a, a thought on on this competition of mini lateral formats because I think it's an interesting one um, and I think we should not lose sight of what uh, these minilateral formations are, are about um, and, and that there are different formats really, or that there are different types of minilateralism. And while, um, you know, originally it should be pretty much problem solving mechanisms, it shouldn't necessarily be institutionalized too much and, and, and the beauty of them is as long as they stay flexible and really just focusing on the issues that they are uh, meant to be addressing, then there should not be any uh, over lab or competition because everyone is fit to address a different issue. And I think that we should not lose sight of, of this initial initial purpose and not really necessarily focus on institutionalizing anything um, or making things more complicated, uh, which you know I was very reassured to see that Quad is not even heading that way, that really we stay in the realm of consultation, we stay in the realm of um, you know keeping the ties close but not necessarily you know creating something that does not need to be created. Um, 
and, and, and I think that that's you know where we're heading with the Quad, with Japan, with the US, and perhaps with this trilateral, which really should stay um, in, in this sort of loose format. Thank you. Professor Sayas, some final words? Yeah, thank you very much. And I think that the good news is that both, as I explained, both EU and Japan are much more responsible global player than before. Particularly, we have seen it uh, in, during the Ukrainian war. And uh, at the same time, the United States government under President Biden has been showing quite sophisticated, careful approach to Ukrainian crisis and war. So in the sense, I think the three parties, powers, have been showing a quite uh, a necessary, relevant answer to the question of the Ukrainian war, even though it is difficult to solve the issue, or to, or it is difficult to see the end of the war still. But at the same time, the approaches that three powers have been showing are more or less appropriate, I would say. And at the same time, uh, each three bilateral partnerships among the three have their own values. And uh, we have, uh, we, we have, uh, we have been seeing that each player, United States, EU, and Japan, has their own distinctive role in the region or in the group. And Japan has so many hallmarks to do in Asia or in the, in the Pacific region. And Europe or EU or NATO have so many hallmarks to do in European region. And at the same time, as a global, global superpower, United States, as I explained, has many hallmarks to do in, at home and in global arena as well. By doing their own homeworks and by enhancing three or three bilateral partnerships, I think that we can see much stronger trilateral cooperation among the three parts. Thank you so much. This concludes our discussion. Thank you to the three of you for, for this fascinating discussion and for our audience for joining online. So the two main takeaways is first, there is a lot of potential for trilateral cooperation. And second, we all need to buy a new, uh, the new books of uh, Mike <laughs> Green on, on Japan defense policy. So thanks again and stay tuned for new analysis from CSIS and CSDS on this uh, fascinating topic.